Pesach edition. We're so excited to be here together with you today. Um, we are going to begin with our Rosh Hashiva, um, Dean of Academics, Ravanit Devorah Zlachauer. Hi, everyone. I think it's good afternoon, at least for most of us. Um, my name is Ravanit Devorah Zlachauer, and I am Rosh Hashiva, an academic dean at Yeshiva Maharat. And it is my job to welcome you all. So welcome. Um, this is Yeshivat Maharat's Power Hour of Torah with the Pesach edition. And before I introduce our wonderful speakers, I want to thank Jofa and Sviva for their co-sponsorship of this program. Our teachers today are four of our musmachot. Rabbi Atara Cohen, coming to you from New York. Rabbanit Michal Kahane, coming to you all the way from Haifa. Rabbi Marian Novak in Chicago and Rabbi Claudia Marbach in Boston. Um, our speakers will deliver words of Torah about the night of the Seder and the Haggadah. I want to focus for a minute on the day before, the 14th of Nisan, or what we call Erev Pesach, which is known in the Torah as the actual Chag HaPesach, the holiday on which we celebrate um, and bring the Korban Pesach, the Paschal Sacrifice. The 14th of Nisan was a momentous occasion in the times of the Beit HaMikdash. As hordes of people came to the temple to offer their Paschal sacrifices, and we have all sorts of descriptions in the Mishnah of what that looked like and the singing of the Hallel that accompanied that. An occurrence like this year, when the 14th of Nisan falls on Shabbat, Raise, raises a dilemma for those times. Do the people sacrifice their Pesach on Shabbat or do they not? The Tosefta and both the Talmud Bavli, the pa Babylonian Talmud and the Talmud Yerushalmi, the Palestinian Talmud tell of a time when the religious leaders forgot the law and they could not remember if the requirement to sacrifice the Pesach on the 14th took precedence or the prohibition of milacha of forbidden labor on Shabbat, took, um, which included slaughtering, took precedence. In each of these sources, the Tosefta and the two Talmuds, Hillel, our famous Hillel, proves through various means, as well as the tradition from his teachers, that indeed the slaughtering of the Pesach takes precedence and is to be done on Shabbat, even though it involves melacha. However, Hillel cannot recall if one is permitted to carry the slaughtering knife, knife on Shabbat as well, or if only those things that are an essential part of the sacrifice are permitted. At this point in the story, Hillel states the following, Hanach lahen Yisrael, im ein nevi'in hein b'nei nevi'in hein, which means literally, leave it to the people. If they are not prophets themselves, they are children of prophets. Or as we might say, trust the people, they'll know what to do. And that's what the leaders do. They sit back, they observe the people, they see that the people don't carry the knives and Hillel then remembers that that indeed is the halacha. Why do I relay this story? It's a story about the relationship between leaders, rabbis and the community. We need leaders who are knowledgeable, steeped in Torah, and we need leaders who know when to listen, observe, and trust. You're about to enjoy an hour of Torah learning from four wonderful teachers. Rabbis who are knowledgeable in Torah, have their own wisdom to share with you, and who believe and trust in our people. Enjoy the learning and Chag Sameach. Hello, I'm Rabbi Claudia Marbach, and I am going to teach you a, do a close reading of a Mishnah from Masachet Psachim. If you would like to follow along in a text, I don't want to share the text, the, the, the screen, I'm putting a link to Safaria in the chat. So I tend, I like to think about Mishnayot as an ethical tip text. I love Mishnah. Many Mishnayot seem to be um, or are thought of as legal texts. 
But I think that they are often um, really, really ethical, ethical texts. And the beginning of the 10th chapter of Psachim, which talks about the Seder, um, can, can be read, read in that vein. Now, um, this, the Masechet Psachim is a really long Masechet. It's a hundred, it runs 121 page dapim. And it only gets to the story of what is essential to our practice of the Seder night in the 10th parak, the 10th chapter on page 99. Before that, it's been talking about the sacrifices, talking about preparing and cleaning. And, um, but in a sense, this is the, this is the chapter where we've been waiting for. So the Mishnah starts with it saying, Erev Psachim Samuch Lemincha. On the eve of Passover, close to Mincha. Now, for most people, that's just a description. Usually we're busy doing last minute things. Maybe if we're really, really organized, we've, we've have a little time to rest before the Seder. Certainly this year, we won't be preparing right before. Um, but this is uh, this line is a sort of a code line. First of all, the Seder, the the whole Masecha, the whole tractate of Psachim starts, as Rabbanit Devora said, before that on the the night the night before the night of the Seder about cleaning up. But about a lot of it, the bulk of of Masecha, um, Psachim talks about what people did on that time before the Seder in the afternoon. And uh, in fact, the commentators say that instead of um, it be the Masecha being called Masecha Pesach, one Pesach, it's called two Pesachim because it's really two um, Masech to put together. It's the Masechet of the, the home ritual and it's the Masechet of the um, sacrificial ritual that took place in the temple. So here we are, it, the, the, we've just finished many chapters about what was going on in the temple at the time of Samuch Lemincha, Mincha time. It's the time where we've stopped eating chametz uh, and we've cleaned out our chametz. And we've, there have been lines and lines of groups of people offering their sacrifice in the temple. It's a time of preparation. We still feel that today. So we have this in-between time. We have this liminal time. It's no longer chametz eating time. And it's not yet Pesach and matzah eating time. And what does the Mishnah say for us to do in this in-between time? Lo yuchal adam ad shetechasha. A person should not eat until it's dark. Now we often feel frustrated that we can't start the Seder um, when it's, until it's dark. And this is the line, this is uh, the line in the Mishnah that, that, that um, originates that idea. But it's giving us advice. It's not telling us to fast. We have ta the notion of Tanit B'chorot, although that's not mentioned in the Babylonian Talmud. It's um, in, in, in Masech B'sachim. It's mentioned in one of the minor tractates and in the, um, in the Yushami, but it doesn't appear in our, in our Masech B'sachim. But why shouldn't somebody eat before dark? Well, Rashi says, gotta be hungry for that matzah. We gotta be excited. and eat the matzah, which is this pinnacle of the, the mitzvah for, uh, for us and for them in the time of the Mishnah, even though they had spent the afternoon preparing their, um, their lamb or goat that they were gonna eat for the mincha, getting it shechted at the, and giving it as a korban and then bringing it home and slow roasting it. Um, and you can imagine the smell of the roast and the whole neighborhoods combined, you know, uh, the smells of the roasting meat wafting around the neighborhoods. Um, so everybody's sort of licking their lips. The Pesach, most people got just a little bite of Pesach of, of, the, of the meat, but people had to eat the, this matzah is the sort of symbol of the Exodus. Um, so Rashi says we should be hungry. And What's interesting, where the, now is that a, is this an ethical text? Yes, yet maybe it's well, it's a psychological text. What what do we want to be doing? We want to be eating. We're getting hungry. Do we have to fast? No, actually, the Gemara will say just you know be full so that you're not uncomfortable. And many of us experience the feeling of 
not wanting of, of being hungry at the Seder. Some people have extra karpas. The Talmud says to put out nuts for the children. Um, so it's a psychological. We know the Mishnah understands where we are. But then it, it says, Afilu ani Israel, lo yochal ad sheyased. That even a poor person amongst the Jewish people should not eat until they are um, until they are reclining. This is a curious thing. Why do poor people particularly have to be um, have to be warned about this? Well, uh, a poor person might feel um, uh, you know that they when they get some food they might want to eat it. Um, immediately. They might not want to save it for later. Uh, um, Tosvot says that a, that a person might, who might not have had food for several days might be very eager to get food. And um, another the other commentaries also talk about the idea of um, that, that a poor person has to be able to recline. We associate reclining at the Seder um, with freedom. And this, this Mishnah is saying, everybody has to be free in this moment. This is not a moment where we can start saying, well, maybe you're not so free. Maybe you don't deserve to, to recline. Um, and maybe we it's a moment where we have to be thinking about others in our community who might not have a comfortable Seder to be at and might not have um, a comfortable bed to lie in, or as they did in the in the Roman forums, sort of way that they used to celebrate um, the the uh, the seder. And um, and we have to and and I think that I mean that's partly why we make sure we give stakami maud chitim before the seder. Um, it's this expansion, and I think all of masechet psachim is about inclusion. We try to expand the number of people who can participate in the holiday. We make sure that we, this is the only holiday where you get a redo of Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach, where if you couldn't come to the first one, we give you an extra chance. Um, that, that we make sure that even if a mouse happens to bring chametz into your house, don't worry about it. You're gonna get rid of it and you're not gonna think about it. And everybody, has to participate. In fact, at one point, the Gemara has a story about someone inviting a prostitute to the Seder. Everybody comes to the Seder. This is the maximalist idea. So everybody has to recline. Everybody is free in this moment. Then the, the, next, the next line starts. V'lo yifachatu me'arba kasot shal yayin. Just say that line. Now, nobody should have less than four cu cups of wine. Now, it's interesting if we look at the grammar here. We've we've been talking about um, individuals here, but lo yifat, yifachatu is in the plural. They should not give him lo less than four cups of wine. This is strange language. Um, who's the they and who is he? Where are we talking about? What, what, what's happening here? The, the mission is very concise with language and very concerned, very fo super focused on, on, what, um, on what each word, each, each word is chosen very carefully. So the commentators understand that the they there is the people from who give out charity. And they get that partly because the next line is even from the charity charity plate, but we, or the soup kitchen. We'll get that for a moment in a moment. They should not give him less. If it were one should not have less, lo me arba kosot, you should not have less than four cups of wine. So what is this talking about? This is talking about our responsibility, the communal responsibility. The people in charge of charity, the charity place or the tzedakah, should not be providing less than four cups of wine. My, why might they? And how, what does that mean? So it, could, it 
in, in one sense, it means that the people giving out tzedakah should not be making value judgment. Everybody gets four cups. We might understand this, uh, you know, who, who might we not give uh, four cups to? Well, maybe we would think if we were a charity that certain people don't deserve four cups because maybe it will be a, um, a challenge for them if they have an addiction problems. But this is a night that we have to decide we don't decide for every, any for anyone. Everybody deserves an equal playing field. Maybe they can request four cups of grape juice instead of wine if that's better for them. But but this notion of freedom is again all inclusive. Everybody comes to the seder. Everybody gets four cups of wine. Tosfo talks about how perhaps um, you only give one set of four cups for the whole family, but. Um, but says that really, no, everybody deserves four cups of wine. This is a holiday where the Gemara says explicitly women are included in the miracle. And so women should drink four cups of wine. Children too, even children under age, everybody deserves this four cups. And finally, afilu min hatam chui, even from the charity plate. The Gemara elsewhere tells us that the, the charity plate um, Oh, no one should take from charity from the from the soup kitchen or charity plate unless they were um, didn't only didn't have unless they have less than two meals worth of food. Everybody should be getting food, and so I really read this as an ethical text. We have an obligation in this moment to make sure everybody can be part of our seders, and I think in this year it includes calling people, talk, talking, uh, before making sure everybody is connected so that we can all be connected to this holiday of freedom. Chag Sameach. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rabbi Marianne Novak, coming to you from Skokie, Illinois. Um, what I'm, I'm going to share my screen. And I want to talk about an interesting comment, uh, concept of for Pesach, which is called Leil Shimurim. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because uh, it came up in my study of Daf Yomi in Pesachim. And it was kind of an idea that there's something spe special about the night of Pesach, the actual night of Pesach. And it comes through and manifests itself and how we understand it in our celebration of Pesach, specifically at the Seder. So um, I want to just start with this idea. And it comes from Parak Bet, chapter 12 of Shemot. And that chapter is chock full of information. It starts with the first mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh. And it kind of toggles back in time for what B'nai Israel needed to do for Pesach Mitzrayim, for the actual, that Pesach that happened while they were leaving uh, um, Egypt. And then later on, some directives of what's going to happen later when they make it to uh, Eretz Yisrael and what that Pesach is going to look like. So it toggles back in time. And we have this very interesting kind of idea that's thrown out there uh, towards the latter of the, of the parak, which says, um, the pasuk is leil shimurim hu l'ashem hotziyami eretz yisraim hu halay l'ashem l'ashem shimurim l'chol b'nei yisrael l'dorotam. That this was for the Lord a night of vigil to bring them out of the land of Egypt. The same night is the Lord's one vigil for all the children of Israel throughout the ages. So it seems that we have two things going on. That that night was a leil shimurim, that there was a vigil that was for God or God was doing, we're not sure. And then it will be for B'nai Israel forever. But the question remains, who's guarding whom? Who is this vigil for? How does this play out? And so the Chachamim have, uh, will, will guide us through um, kind of like three different approaches, which all manifest themselves in how we, in, in the Haggadah actually, in the way that we run our seders. So I'm gonna to go to Rashi first. Um, and Rashi says that we have a couple things going on. One is that, we have uh, a shimurim where God is watching us and watching the time. And when we go all the way back to Breshi to Genesis, we have the discussion of Lech Lecha, of the Brit Ben Abitarim, 
the covenant of the pieces where God says to Abraham, like, I'm going to take care of you. But by the way, you're going to have these moments where you're going to be in Egypt and enslaved. But don't worry, I'll come back and get you. So here it's it's a fulfillment of Hashem's promise to us that he was watching. He was watching and seeing what was going on. We're going to see that uh, idea developed a little bit uh, longer. And that um, also on that there's a an idea that on that night, in the same way on the actual night, where Makat Bacharot, where the slaughter of the firstborn was also happening at the same time, that God was protecting B'nai Israel because outside their door was the Malcham of it, was the angel of death. So there's a kind of idea that for this night, this night will be a time when B'nai Israel will always be taken care of. There will always be this super kind of protection, this extra vigil, God is paying particular attention to us. And at that time, um, we'll see about Nisan in a second. At that time, that will be the time that God will take care of us in that way. So again, we see that this, the one who's watching in this in these interpretations is God who's watching B'nai Israel, uh, remembering a promise, fulfilling covenant, and making sure nothing happened to us during Pesach Mitzrayim and also in the future. I'm going to go to the Sifte Chachamim, which is going forward a lot in time, but this particular commentary is what we call a super commentary on Rashi, and he kind of develops this idea uh, a little a little bit further, meaning that it's a continual night of destructive forces, which means now and forever, on this night of Pesach, who's ever out to get us, whatever thing in the universe or in the natural world is out to destroy us, that night we will be protected. So it has, when it says Lodorotam, when it's for all generations, the, uh, from the Pasuk, the idea is that it's going to be forever. This is a night that Hashem will watch us forever and we will be protected from any uh, destructive forces. Now, what they're talking about here, if they're relating back to what they're talking about in the Gemara, they were actually talking about actual demons. And that's how the, the idea of Leil Shimurim comes up in the discussion of the Gemara. Now, that's not my favorite topic, but moving forward, we'll keep an idea of beyond just demons, but everything that we can consider is something dangerous for us. Okay. Um, and in Pesachim, here it is, uh, the idea that um, um, they're actually having a discussion of how you can drink the cups of wine and whether if you drink them in pairs, this will bring about some sort of outside demons that will come and hurt you. And they're telling you, well, you're, it's not really drinking in pairs and each cup has a separate mitzvah. Oh, and by the way, the night that you're drinking, don't worry about it because it's Leil Shimurim and Hashem is going to watch you on that night. So don't worry, no harm will come to you at that, at that point in time. Okay, now the, the, um, uh, the Ibn Ezra, um, kind of starts to move the idea that it's not only Hashem who's watching, but B'nai Israel is watching. And B'nai Israel is, when we use the word lishmor, in, especially in regard to mitzvot, we mean observance of mitzvot. So he turns the term of idea that, uh, of watching, that B'nai Israel is watching. And what kind of watching are they doing? They're keeping watch. They're watching over the city. They're watching and which way they're doing it. They couldn't sleep because they were so uh, involved in the observance of the mitzvot of Pesach. And there's a kind of understanding there, it, and this also relates back to the Brit uh, Ben Avitarim, that if we are scrupulous in our mitzvot, if we are lishmor, if we are the shimurim, if we are become the vigil, then Hashem will come and redeem us. This is our way of showing loyalty to a Kaddish, Kaddish Baruch Hu. And this plays out in the Seder when we have the story of the five rabbis who are sitting in B'nai Brak and they're sitting up all night long and they're to the point where their students are, have to knock on the door and say, yo, it's, you know, it's time for Kriya Shema, Kriya Shema Shal Shacharit, you, you, gotta, you gotta get going. So there's a lot of speculation from historians exactly what they were talking about. There's an idea, we have Rabbi Akiva there that perhaps they were plotting, getting ready to have the rebellion, the Bar Kokhva rebellion against the Roman Empire, which they were living under. But uh, I, I think a way that really fits into what we're talking about is that they were the Shimurim. They were staying up all night, being scrupulous in the telling of the story and the mitzvot of the, of the Seder of Pesach. And also because they were up, they were also keeping watch, keeping watch on, on everybody else, knowing that it's Leil Shemarim, that nothing would happen to them. But they, in turn, they were the ones who were holding the vigil. And that manifests itself in this story in the, in the, um, uh, uh, in the in Haggadah. Um, the Chizkuni also picks up on, on this idea and that um, when we talk about Shimurim, this is also uh, when it comes from that we should be very careful when it talks about korbanot specifically. We should be very uh, the 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 Torah 
uses Pesukim to tell us, especially bringing Korbanot, that you have to be very careful about the time. I, you know, people always say about law that possession is nine tenths of the law. I think for halacha and Jewish law, it's all about time. It's all about time. You get the time wrong, you're forever in a loop that will never end, never mind about what you own. Um, so here, they, the Chizkuni is developing and sharpening that idea even more so that it's not just those of the Seder, but whenever we look in the Torah, when it talks about those specific mitzvot that have korbanot, it's that shamar. You got to get at the right time. You have to watch the animal. There's a lot of watching, a lot of watching and a lot of care that goes on when we talk about those mitzvot. So that's that mitzvah prong that B'nai Yisrael performs on the Leil, Leil, um, Leil, Leil Shimurim. Now, um, we talked about the importance of that day. And in uh, Masechet Rosh Hashanah, we have that this, that that time, that time of Nisan, it's not only a time that the Kaddish Baruch Hu will watch us and take care of us, but it's at that specific time that he will watch and see whether it's time to bring us the ultimate redemption, whether it's time to, to, to um, bring Mashiach for us. And it's that, that special moment, it's, it's the, it, it contemplates all the things that we're talking about. We have God watching us. We in turn are, are trying to do our best to follow our obligations to a Kodesh Baruch Hu. And at that time, he will decide at that moment, because that's the time when he's looking, whether the ultimate redemption will come. And obviously this comes out in the Seder. I know uh, Rabbi Atara Cohen is gonna talk a little bit about Eliyahu and why he's there, but here's uh, one, we might be overlapping just a little bit, but we'll see, again, we have Eliyahu coming. Um, also, we'll, we'll see that at the end. I just wanna talk about the Sforno a little bit. Um, the Sforno develops this idea of God watching and bringing the redemption and also an idea that he brought the redemption earlier than was expected in Mitzrayim. If you do all the math, which a lot of people spend a lot of time doing and make the miracle even greater, that even though he promised to redeem us, that it came earlier than he was supposed to, that he was able to think about Mechashev et HaKetz. He was thinking about when this end, this end time was gonna come and he was able to change it. And so that piece is also here that he watched and, and saw and in the same way that he was able to bring us out of Egypt a little bit earlier, this should give us hope that perhaps he will bring Mashiach and our ultimate redemption a little earlier as well in the same in the same day and in the same night. And the Amak Adavar also brings up this idea that the Leil Shemurim is that every night Hashem is kind of uh, storing up those vigils. So kind of uh, we're kind of banking it so that when the time comes, if he's debating whether to bring it early or not, we have all this insurance, this insurance that Hashem will come and, and deliver us from every type type of, of affliction. Um, and um, the Kliyakar also brings out the idea that it's the Leil Shemurim is B'nai Israel is corresponding to Israel's guarding the mitzvot, as it is stated, watching for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. That this is this is who's doing the watching. The watching is is Hashem watching us, but also we are watching the mitzvot. Now, the next two pieces that I have here. Um, I, I have to thank Safaria where I found all these wonderful sources and Safaria has now uploaded the commentary of the late great Nechama Leibovitz, but also have, has uploaded her famous Gilyonim, these like worksheets that she sent out to her students who, you know, with, with a little bit of fear and trepidation, I think filled out to the best that they could. And then she would, she would send them in and she would grade them. And um, apparently it was a very um, uh, purifying experience. Um, but she mentions um, in just her strict, uh, very careful read that, um, that uh, uh, from uh, Rabbi Yosef Ibn Caspi is that um, we have a night of first it's watching, Hashem is watching, and then we have watching of the children of, of Israel. And he said, and, and here is for a nominalized verb can be attached to both the subject and the object. So when uh, uh, Rabbi Yosef Ibn Kaspi was reading those Pesukim, he was noting what we were seeing, that it is a reciprocal kind of relationship. It could be e either one. Now, the next thing that she found was from Rabbi Yehuda Leib Ben Svi Hirsch Shapira, uh, who had this set of Perushim called Arechasim La Bika, the ridges of the ridges of the valley. And what he notices is that when it comes to Pesach especially, the word, the root, lishmor, is used a bazillion times about B'nai Israel and what their behavior is supposed to be. That that watching forever, 
that that Dorotam, that that um, un, that uh, eternal peace that we see, or everlasting peace that we see from Bnei Yisrael, comes from their their watching and their preparing and their uh, uh, being very scrupulous in their mitzvot re uh, regarding Pesach as, and especially the, the Seder. Now, as I mentioned, many of these things manifest themselves in different ways that uh, in an actual liturgy that we see in the Haggadah. Um, in the Magid Sekhen Vehi Amda, this reflects the idea that this is a day that will always be a night that will always be for us that we will be taken care of. And here they've always, you know, this is the, they, this is our, our classic. They tried to kill us and and they didn't, and God saved us, and now let's eat eat some more. And classically, we you know we raise the wine. Many people have the tradition to raise their coast, their their wine glass here, and again in every generation, Ella Shebekol Dor Vador, which I think is echoing this piece of Lodorotam that we saw in the pasuk to begin with. And then we have all the pieces that come together of. B'nai Israel following mitzvot, of Hashem watching us specifically on that night that nothing will help happen to us. And then on that night is that special night when Mashiach will come, when we have this very, I, I think it's a little strange part of our a Seder, um, when, we, when we say Shavuot Hamarcha. Many of us have the tradition, we open up the door uh, and we open up the door, we always say open up the door for Eliyahu. But I think there's a, another thing that's going on here. It's a Leil Shimurim, it's a night that we are, feel that we are absolutely safe, that God is watching over us. And when we open up the door, it's as if we are saying, we're, we're not scared. We're gonna open up the door and you can come and see what's going on. In my family, uh, which is of a German custom, uh, they, they did not have anything red or use red wine on their tables at all because of the blood libels. And when they opened up the door, it was a way to say, Come and look and see what we're doing. We're not slaughtering children. We have no blood of human beings here. And with a kind of confidence, because it's Leil Shemarim, that God is going to be taking care of us. And watch us how we observe our Seder. And this is how we're watching. And Eliyahu is coming because it's the idea that this is the night, this is the time in Nisan, when Hashem is going to come and give us uh, our final redemption. Hopefully, um, all the Leil Shemarim, all the Shemarim that we've banked up as insurance will come and take and take and take care of us. So um, especially this year, um, it's been so important that we watch out for one another and that we take care of one another. And this is kind of uh, echoing what uh, Rabbi Claudia said, that we need to take care of one another, but with a confidence that Hashem is gonna take care of us too. And I think as opposed to last year, I hope all of you are feeling just a little bit either with vaccination or, or the rates going down of COVID that we're feeling that a little bit of Geula, that we're feeling a little bit of Hashem watching us and taking care of us. And at the same time, we still have to make sure that we're watching over everybody else and make sure that they're coming along with us on this day. And hopefully, we will have Mashiach come for our ultimate redemption. Chag Hashem V'sameach. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, Rabbi Marianne, for uh, being my tag team here. I'm really excited to talk to you about rede more redemption and more Eliyahu. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Hold on one moment. There we go. That, can I just get a thumbs up if that worked? Awesome. Thanks, everybody. So I want to talk a little bit about why we bring Eliyahu to our Seder. Um, and specifically look at what the rabbis think about Eliyahu. So it's actually quite a strange practice that we have to bring Eliyahu to our Seder. The Haggadah does not really explain why or what he's doing there. So I want to take a few moments together to think about why is Eliyahu coming to our Seder? I also think that this is a really vivid part of the Seder for many of us. I remember as a child waking up in the morning and trying to see, oh, is any wine gone from the Kos Eliyahu? Did he come last night? Um, I know my great aunt would sometimes drink the Kos Eliyahu, not because she wanted to trick the children, but because she just wanted more wine. It just becomes this very vivid uh, part of the Seder for so many of us, and it's actually very unclear why it's there. So. This is just a quote from the Ashkenazi Haggadah. This is the only mention we have of Eliyahu. We pour the cup of Eliyahu and we open the door. Totally clear, why is, what's he doing? What's he, Eliyahu doing here? 
is he coming in the door? Why do we want him at our Seder? Um, and then we read a very harif, a very uh, spicy uh, statement about other people. Pour your wrath upon the nations that did not know you and upon the kingdoms that did not call upon your name, since they have consumed Yaakov and laid waste his habitation. Pour out your fury on, upon them, and, and the fierceness of your anger shall reach them. You shall pursue them with anger and eradicate them under the skies of the Lord. We don't, this is kind of an uncomfy uh, phrase to read because we don't like to have this type of anger, but this is the Eli all we know about bringing Eliyahu to our Seder. Something about opening the door with a um, with bringing bring some wine to Eliyahu, and then this very harif statement of pouring out God's wrath against our enemies. So what I want to do is explore who is Eliyahu and why might we want him at our Seder. So Eliyahu in the Tanakh is very different than the person we're going to talk about here. Eliyahu the Tanakh is not so nice. Eliyahu the Tanakh um, is a zealous, is zealous for God, does not care about the Israelites that much, really wants Israelites to worship God at their own risk. Um, so he's so not nice that he actually gets fired. He is um, picked up in a fiery chariot, taken to the sky, and never heard from again. Well, he has heard from again. That's the fun part. He is, um, he never dies. And so the, the later commentaries use this as a way to say, okay, if Eliyahu never dies, then we know that maybe he could come back. Maybe he knows more about God than we might know. And then later, he's somewhat associated with Egyptian in Malachi, which is a late Navi. Um, we read in the Haftorah of Shabbat HaGadol, Behold, I am sending before you Eliyahu Anavi. So what we see is Eliyahu Anavi in the Tanakh, not such an ally of the Jewish people, um, very allied with God, but really, really just so zealous for God, he's not so friendly to the Jews. Then God says, you know what, you've had enough time being a Navi, you're not an ally, we're gonna sweep you off, you're, um, you're not punished, we're just like, you're gonna go in a chariot in the sky, you're gonna be away for a while. But then something very curious happens for the rabbis. Eliyahu, in Eliyahu's post-Tanakh life, becomes a great ally of the Jewish people, becomes super friendly with the rabbis, and shows up a lot and has, offers a lot of helpful advice and wisdom. In particular, Eliyahu has really interesting things to say about the redemption to come, the redemption that will come in the future. And what we're going to look at is we're going to look at two stories. One of them is my favorite in the Talmud, so get excited for that, uh, which talks about who Eliyahu is and to the rabbis. And this is two among many, many, many stories where Eliyahu hangs out with the rabbis and offers them helpful wisdom. So this is from the end of Sanhedrin. And Eliyahu the prophet said to Rav Yehuda, the, the brother of Rav Salah Hasina, the world will exist no fewer than 85 jubilee cycles or 4,250 years. And during the final jubilee, the son of David, the Mashiach will come. So Eliyahu is giving us this helpful information. This is how long the world will last. This is how you can anticipate when Mashiach is gonna come. But then Rav Yehuda asks a very good question. Will the Messiah come during the beginning of the Jubilee or during its end? Elijah said to Rav Yehuda, I don't know. Rav Yehuda asked, will this Jubilee cycle end before the Messiah comes or will not yet end before his coming? Elijah said to him, I don't know. So Eliyahu has a sense of when Mashiach is gonna come, has a, really wants to be able to give this really important information to the Israelites and also is hindered in some sort of way. And we're gonna see that hindrance and where it comes from in our next story. So this is from Baba Matsya 85B. You could follow along in the Aramaic on the top. I will be reading the English. Elijah was often found in the academy of Rabbi Yehud Hanasi. They were friends. One day, it was a new moon, the first of the month, and Eliyahu was delayed and not, did not come to the academy. Later, Rabbi Yehud Hanasi said to Eliyahu, what is the reason the master was delayed? Why are you late, Eliyahu? You always come on time. Eliyahu said to him, I had to wake up Avraham, wash his hands, 
and wait for him to pray and lay him back down again. And similarly, I followed the same procedure for Isaac and similarly for Jacob in turn. Rabbi Yehuda then asks a very logical question. Eliyahu, why don't you wake them all up at the same time? And already this is like a kind of crazy story. We kind we don't really know how Eliyahu is hanging out with our forefathers who are long dead. Eliyahu responded, I maintain that if I were with it, it would wake up all three to pray at the same time, they would generate pow powerful prayers and bring the Messiah prematurely. Eliyahu, for whatever reason, is not allowed to let Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov pray together to bring Mashiach. Because if they pray at the same time, Mashiach is going to come and we're going to be redeemed. And presumably, that's not a good thing to happen yet. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said to Eliyahu, and is there anyone alive in this world who's comparable to them and can produce such efficacious prayers? Eliyahu said, yeah, they're Rabbi Chia and his sons. So Rabbi Yehuda has a great idea. Rabbi Yehuda decreed a fast, a day where prayer is extra powerful, and the sages brought Rabbi Chia and his sons down to the pulpit to pray on behalf of the congregation. So they started saying the bracha mechayim meeting. So first he says, meshiv um, haruach, the, who, God who makes the wind blow, in the wind blew. Rabbi Chia recited the phrase, umarid hageshem, who makes the rain fall, and the rain fell. So clearly the prayers, prayers are really powerful. And the next line is, mechaye um, meitim. And as Rabbi Chia was saying, was about to say the phrase, mechaye meitim, there was a little bit of earthquake. The uh, people started to wake up from their graves. That was too much for God. They said in heaven, who is the revealer of secrets in the world? They said, it's Eliyahu. Eliyahu, God is wondering who on earth gave away our secrets and is allowing Mashiach to come early. And everybody outs Eliyahu. So Eliyahu, poor Eliyahu is brought to heaven where he's beaten with 60 fiery lashes. And then after being punished such, he decides that he needs to rectify his actions. He came back down to earth disguised as a bear of fire. He came among the congregation and distracted them for, from their prayers. So pretty powerful story. Um, some takeaways about why we might want this Eliyahu at our Seder. One, Eliyahu really wants to bring the redemption, perhaps even earlier than God wants to bring redemption. Eliyahu is the one who wants to give us all the secrets and wants to bring Mashiach for us faster, even before God. So we want Eliyahu as our ally at the Seder to bring this redemption. So the entire Seder is so focused on our past redemption and often ignores the fact that we live in Galut. We live in a society that still experiences oppression of all sorts and injustice and horrible things are still happening in the world as good as our lives are in different ways. And this is a rare moment in the Seder where we recognize the pain and anger still in the world. And with this invitation, we hope that we could speed along the process of redemption. Maybe if God's not gonna listen to us, we'll get some help with Eliyahu so we can live in a world truly free of oppression. So thanks everybody. I hope you have a wonderful Pesach and I will pass the baton. Hello. Rabbi Atar, will you stop your screen share? Oh, yes. Thank you. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? <clears throat> we hear you. Go for it, Reveni Micha. All right. Okay. So I'm, uh, if you notice the unusual background, not in Israel, um, as part of going from uh, slavery to freedom, symbolically, managed to get to my daughter's wedding. So big simcha with the seum of Sachim uh, and everything and happy to be here with you on this uh, day and this joint limud. I wanna share a couple of thoughts from uh, Masechet Pesachim, which we just finished, that have to do with our Seder and kind of with, with who we are. I'm not gonna share a screen, I'm just gonna talk with you and share uh, together. So two, two quick ideas. Um, the first one is from the Mishnah, famous Mishnah. 
on uh, the uh, one one uh, sixteen <laughs> um, uh, Aleph, and the Mishnah says, "Mazgulo kosheni v'chan aben shoel avi." They pour to him a second cup, and here is where the son asks the father. And um, this is, of course, where we find the four questions in the Haggadah. And the question is, why here the four questions? And of course, it's like this is where the evening becomes, uh, turns strange. At first, we had kiddush. Kids were like, OK, this is a normal meal. Uh, strange hand washing, dipping, but pouring a second cup. What? This is when we're supposed to go and have uh, dinner. So here is, naturally, where the son would ask his father, why is this night different? On this opening, there is a Rashbam um, who brings a quote from one of Rashi's teachers that says, it's not supposed to be vechan habel shoel, here is where the son is asking, ela vechen. And so it goes that this is where the son is asking, just like in the Torah, it says, ken bnot lofchat, and this is the quote, like, this is the, the daughters of the Slovchat, they speak truthfully, they speak honestly, and the Rashbam is saying about it that it's deemed to ask the questions here, like here you must ask the questions. So this seems, uh, initially, it seems like, um, my dude, what's it, there's one Aleph, Khan, Kaf, Aleph, Nun, Chen, Ken, Kaf, Nun, why are you making a big deal of little details? Of course, the Gemara loves making a big deal of little details. So um, how we can look at it and maybe bring it home to us is that there's really two ways to think about the Haggadah that are hidden inside this minutia little difference. The first one is Khan is like, Listen, the child is looking around. We evoked questions in him. This is where it's appropriate for him to ask questions naturally. And if he doesn't ask, then the father uh, teaches him. Zechen, like this is the deen, as Rashbam says, meaning this is the order. Here must come the questions of the Seder. And I guess the, the challenge for us, which is an ongoing challenge for families, um, individuals, how we do the Seder every year between these two um, options. Is it something that we roll with it and we evoke questions and we notice who are the participants around and they naturally ask and it's a discussion and a storytelling and all that? Or do we have a book in front of us and we just have to go cover to cover and it's Dean, it's must that here are the questions and here is the answer and here is how we do things. So what, what is our Seder question to us? Is it something that a little more flowy with the participants, participant dependent, or is it by the book, literally by the book? I, I often think that uh, it's, a, it's a tragic day in our history and a joyful day, of course, we always have to hold the opposite, that the Haggadah was written, because Haggadah milishon lehagid, to tell, to speak. And once the story was written, some of that speech was taken away from us. So can we find it within the text to bring that back and have part of it, um, not just a book that we read, not always with understanding cover to cover, but that we do this pe uh, interpretation for Pesach, the mouth that's speaking, and we use our mouth for things that go in and things that come out, like the story. Um, so that's one consideration more specific for the Seder and for our families, how to hold that event. And another idea from uh, Pesachim that I really liked as I, uh, there were there were lots. I'm looking forward to another seven and a half years when we come back to this track date. But um, just kind of on Ktema's uh, leg on the tip of the fork. The opening of chapter eight um, talks, brings an idea of someone who's half a slave, half a free person. 
And what do they do? Because if they eat from Korban Pesach, then which half of them is eating? If they eat the, from the master, then turns out the master feeds also the half free person. So what do we do with someone who has this like mixed status? Initially, Bet Hillel says someone who is half a slave, half a free person, they uh, work for their master um, half a week and they're free another part of the week, like a part-time job. So that's great, convenient for the master. But Bet Shemai say, this is actually terrible for the slave because it's good on a, for the job, but it's bad for his status because he can't marry. He can't marry a servant woman because he's half free. And he can't marry a half uh, a free woman because he's half a slave. So you have to force the master that's still holding on to his half to let him go. And the slave owes him whatever it is that the debt that's left. So, okay, solve that, nice. Uh, what is it doing in Psachim? And it's actually a question that appears in different parts throughout the Gemara and appears for us here. Why is it here on Psachim? So there is possibly a hint that the half slave, half free person or individual entity, that's us. It's the Jewish people on that eve of exiting Egypt. We were slaves, if it's, it may be a harsh word, but we were um, owned kind of by two masters, Pharaoh and Hashem. Hashem let us go. So half of us was free. Then what about Pharaoh? Pharaoh needed to let us go as well. So Pharaoh was forced. He's like the master that had no choice but to let us go. But then we have a debt to Pharaoh. Pharaoh is representing the world because we have to pay for our freedom, for our opportunity to be in the world and fulfill our mission. So maybe if the first question was more as a family and individuals, how we specifically run the Seder, how we as individuals run our relationship with Hashem, is it by the book or is it more uh, flowy or is it some combination of both? The second one is a question for us in our role in the world. Do we still have a debt and what do we do with it? So hopefully it's a night of uh, questions and learning and thinking, wishing everybody a wonderful Pesach, wherever you are. Great to be with you here today. Chag Sameach, please in person one day. Thank you so much to our speakers from today, to Rabbi Nita Vora, to Rabbi Claudia Marbach, to Rabbi Marianne Novak, to Rabbi Tara Cohen, and to Rabbi Nita Michal Kahana. Um, just a few, you know, housekeeping notes. We want to make sure that you have access to the vast resources that are available this year. We will be emailing out the recording of today's um, Power Hour, as well as it's already up on our Facebook page. So tag your friends, share with family. Um, we would love to be able to share this widely. Additionally, just this morning in an email from Maharaj, no right. you got an email, you got information. About maybe, I don't know, maybe not new, today. I don't know. Um, our brand new Pesach companion that we produce in partnership with Yeshivat Chovavei Torah and with the International Rabbinic Fellowship. There are 24 pieces in that amazing resource. So download it, print it, get it ready for reading over Shabbat as you get ready for your Seder. And finally, um, I know it's like the talk of the town. It's not going to be breaking news to any of you because you've probably already all binge listened to the first five episodes of My Rat's first podcast called My Ratcast. I put that into the chat before. It was also in your email this morning. So definitely check that out. Um, join us this evening with Trisha and for, at 8 p.m. for the Cedar com Telling Conversation with Darshanit, Dr. Miriam Udell. And we just wish you all a Chag Kasher V'Sameach.